So welcome everybody to something rather unusual for this channel. Um, this is the first podcast I've ever uploaded. Now I'm partially doing this to celebrate getting 100,000 subscribers. By the way, thank you to everyone for doing that. There'll be a video on that a little bit later on. But I also wanted to start this series because I've noticed as my time as a master's and PhD student, I've met a lot of really interesting people. And with this platform that we have, I really want to get them the chance to speak about what it's like in their specific research field. Because I know a lot of people watching this channel are themselves wondering, what is it I want to do when I'm older? I'm, I'm into coding now. Um, I like physics. I like math. I like engineering. What is it that I should do when I'm older? And I think the best way to determine that is to listen to people who are in these various fields. Now, there's certainly no better way to start off this podcast series than by interviewing my old master supervisor, Dr. Michelle Lefebvre. Now, Dr. Lefebvre is a professor of physics at the University of Victoria in British Columbia, Canada. His research interests and contributions focus on the exploration of the laws of nature using proton collisions at the highest available energies. He's a founding member of the Atlas Collaboration at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, and he also acted as founding spokesperson of the Atlas Canada Collaboration in 1992. Now, believe it or not, I actually first met Dr. Lefebvre before I even entered into undergrad at university. I was part of a high school class and we were touring the university to see what different degrees would be like. And there was a, a physics, they called it a master class going on where they would show data that was going on in the field of physics, what it was like to be a sort of graduate student and even undergraduate student in the department of physics. And they were showing a lot of the results that occurred at the Large Hadron Collider over in Geneva. And it was very interesting. And I'm fairly certain that this was the experience that led me to pursue a career in physics. So without further ado, I introduce you to Dr. Michel Lefebvre. What was it that led you to do something like physics? And why would you choose physics over something like uh, math or engineering? Right. Well, as a, when I was a young boy, I really enjoyed mathematics. And then eventually I got interested in electronics and, you know, things like that. Um, so I was always very attracted by science. So this is, I'm talking here quite young. And then um, eventually I realized that uh, what I was really interested in was, you know, how atoms work, how why chemistry works the way it does. And then I realized also in my late teens, or actually, no, but more like around 16 years old, I realized that the math that I liked, which was at that time calculus, I learned it quite young, uh, was really a tool for physics. So what made you what made you want to learn calculus at some, such a young age? I know that's a... Yeah, I think that the story starts quite young. It starts when I was probably, oh, I, mean, I remember grade two. So I must have been like <laughs> seven, six or seven years old. And I, and I was already doing a lot of you know, algebra and things like this that were a bit ahead of the class. People were learning their math tables. <laughs> and and so um, I was very much interested in geometry initially because my dad was an architect and there was a lot of drawing equipment at home and, and, you know, circles and triangles. And I was always fascinated by this as a kid. And then eventually I got interested in geometry and the math that goes with it. And I got fascinated by the number of pi probably by the age of seven or eight or something. And then that led to the question, why is the surface of a circle pi r squared, you know, or why the volume of the spheres, four third pi r cubed, where does that come from? And then, and then I was asking teachers about this and they told me that I should look into um, what's called calculus and that involves limits and then derivatives and then integrals. And then, so I got into a quest of trying to understand the root of all this, but that led to much, much bigger uh, interest. And by, by the age of 15, I'd gone through that program and had finished most of the calculus that one uses at the university. And, and then I realized that it was a tool for something else. And so that's, that's how it started, really. It was an interest in geometry. So university must have been a breeze for you then if you'd done well, no uh, no i had to spend more time learning physics right right and uh, and doing other things i did some you know work in the student union and i had other other time for other things but um but it gave me more time to spend on physics and right. other things i did learn you know german and a few other oh, things oh. there but, you uh, go but it was more time i could i could focus more on the physics 
what I find now that I teach physics is that a lot of students, uh, most students, math and physics are difficult at the same time. And then to use a tool that you don't possess very well to learn something that's not obvious is, is difficult. And so that gave me an edge to be able to focus on the laws of physics as opposed to just struggling through the math to actually, you know, see how it goes. See, that's kind of an opinion I had about math and physics is I know the way it's taught now is you get into a lot of the physics early on before you know a lot of the math. And I guess there's arguments to be made for learning the physics first to inspire you to learn about, you know, things like quantum mechanics that are cool and seem amazing. But I personally found the like earlier courses in the physics degree more difficult than the later ones, specifically because I didn't have the mathematical tools to like fully understand what's going on. And so would you, if you had the choice, do you think the program could benefit more from learning more mathematics beforehand, including in high school as well? Uh, I'm not sure that that would be best for everyone. I mean, some people really like math early, others really hate it. And so it's not completely clear to me what one, which one would be best. Um, I think one thing that's certain is I found that high schools in, in, in Canada, at least in part where I am now, don't, um, don't provide adequate training in mathematics because there have been decisions made to, to spend more time on other things. And so that that shows when people start and enter the sciences. That's not the same elsewhere. There are other parts of the world where math is pushed much stronger, much you know, much harder. But that also has negative consequences. So at the end, it's a, it's a, it's, there's no magic solution. But a little bit more math savviness, minimal, you know, at high school would help for people that want to enter into sciences. And I find that for the majority of students, they're struggling. They're, like you said, in their first year at university because they lack basic mathematics skills like algebra or um, a bit of logic as well. What really tied everything together for me, I think was taking a, a second a second year linear algebra course. And, you know, you, you learn regular sort of algebra and things like that in high school. And you start to learn about things like matrices and dealing with almost almost like multiple problems at the same time. You you have multiple equations all put into a nice, neat little notation. I think once I took, really started to understand linear algebra, that's when physics started to make more sense to me. I think that uh, something that would work well is an interplay between learning mathematics and seeing what it's for, the use. What I find often is some people don't like, actually many students don't like mathematics. They say they don't like mathematics because they learn it in a math course, which does not emphasize what it is for. And unless you're somebody that really likes math for math, and there are people, of course, that love that, the majority of people are not like this. They want to see why am I learning matrices? Why am I learning this algebra thing? X, Y, Z, why am I learning all this? What is it good for? So if you can give exciting examples as you go along learning the math, I think this would be a winning um, winning situation for most students. Like I said, there are students that would just do pure math right from the get-go, but they're a minority. And so if you can if you can bring the excitement of the math through it, its usage and, and its use in other areas, physics, but not only, it could be other examples, then uh, I think that would that would help a lot. And so what you're saying is that you got to a point where you knew enough math that you could enjoy the physics. And this goes both ways. You can enjoy the physics if you know enough math eventually. Well, I think I'm, yeah, I'm certainly a very skeptical person when it comes to most things. And I feel like if I don't have that full description of something, and that, that can be a flaw too, I think, at the same time. There's different modes of learning. Yeah, when I teach their students are all different kinds. There's some that, you know, really see the mathematics, that's how they see. Others that they need to see it in their head. They need to see the phys physical phenomena. They, the math is something else. And, and so they have different modes of learning and, and the difficulties to make sure you grab as many of the students as possible. So anyway, but the mathematics is, is would be good to have more examples as to what it's for when it's taught. Right, right. Yeah, in general. So moving on to the stuff you've done sort of in your career, uh, you've worked for CERN for most of your life since you were probably 
was it more than half your life now? <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. So I, I started being in, um, affiliated with the CERN laboratory when I started my, well, actually when I was a, a summer student here in Victoria. So for context, for everybody who's watching this, CERN is a, the largest physics collaboration in the world. Um, you can correct me, by the way, if I get anything wrong on this. Well, I'd um, say CERN is, a, CERN is, is, is the um, Centre Européen de Recherche Nucléaire, which really it's a big particle physics laboratory, the largest laboratory in the world, located near Geneva. And, you know, it was founded in 1954, not a long time after the UN, I think. And so, so it's an old institution that was, like I said, founded after the Second World War as a counterbalance to the American um, uh, uh, strength in, in nuclear physics and particle physics at the time. And um, in 1984, I was a young summer student here in Victoria. I'd never been west of Ottawa at the time. I was from Quebec City and in Eastern Canada. And um, I joined a group here that, that uh, a, a new group, that was founded by a professor that came from the UK and was involved at CERN already and had been part of the discovery of the W and the Z bosons that took place in 1982 and 83. So this, so I came in 84 and started to work with that group and was already involved in CERN physics and add computer accounts and whatever that had to do with CERN. And I got to learn how, what kind of environment it was without going there. And it's um, did the same thing for two summers in a row. And then when I started my PhD, uh, in England, in Cambridge, in 1985, and I joined one of the experiments at CERN that discovered the W and the Z boson. So I, in '85, I started to be a CERN affiliate, or '86 to be precise. I started to be a CERN affiliate directly and go to the facility. So There's something I'm beautiful. Being affiliated with the CERN laboratory ever since um, in my research. There's something beautiful about having all the different nationalities grouped together at one research facility and especially all aimed at a at a very similar goal was it was it a culture shock was there anything you know you you take people from a whole bunch of different cultures and there's slightly different norms i guess that everybody has was there any difficulties you know um between groups of people uh not uh, not that i i mean as at the when i was a young man then i didn't really see these problems if they existed i'm, I'm but i it's true that it was uh, an amazing environment where you worked with the best people in the world, come from all sorts of countries. At that time, it was mainly European countries and North America, but there were also people from Australia. And 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 by the time the by the mid to late eighties, there were Russian collaborators, Chinese collaborators, people from India. I mean, there were people from all over the world, and um, that was amazing uh, for you know a little guy that came from Quebec City. And so I had a lot to learn and it was, um, uh, you could make you dizzy after a while because it, it, every week that I was at CERN when I was in my early twenties, I just learned something new about culture, about language, about physics, about computing. It was, CERN was a very big computing, uh, strong uh, center in the world at the time, still is, but it was then even bigger. And so, yeah, it was an exciting time um, for me in my life in terms of experiences. But certainly, yeah, CERN was, to me, is remains um, the archetype of international collaboration. And of course, people's goal at CERN is pure research and science. And so that makes the environment quite unique. Mm -hmm. And so working with all those countries too, I'm sure, you know, the history of the world, there's been conflicts that happen sometimes between different countries. Um when something like that happens um, with the countries at CERN, um, how do the people interact? You know, suppose something's going on with Russia, for example, which most people have no control, control over. over which country right. they well, there from. were other occasions. I mean, there were Balkan wars also. They, they, there's been other conflicts that were, you know, within the, the range of institutions that were part of the CERN uh, environment. Um, you know, CERN was created uh, with the idea of bringing people together for a common scientific goal. And, and that is still, is, is obviously still very true. And um, the idea there is to um, promote collaboration, not to create barriers. 
So when there are conflicts like this, the the call is to, you know, is to uh, try to keep the collaboration as long as possible and to not be interfered by conflicts. But of course, it creates tension. But um, that is the goal. I mean, if you look carefully at the way that CERN has handled the crisis with the the war in Ukraine, the, this was done with that in mind. And we have a lot of Russian scientists working in our collaboration. They are excellent people. And so, you know, how where do you go from there? And so it's it's complicated. It's a but, very tough moral question. Yeah. That's right. And then, you know, I don't feel I'm particularly competent to talk about all the aspects of it, but it but it 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 has not stopped and it has not stopped the uh, CERN laboratory to continue to function and to promote uh, you know, peaceful collaboration between all parties. And there's something inspiring that for people on the outside who aren't a part of the collaboration, seeing that even though these different groups of people, the countries, the governments, whatever, might be in conflict with each other, the, the people of the nations can still come together peacefully to work towards a noble uh, scientific goal. And it might actually hint at, you know, the sort of things that do bring people together, that if we all have some sort of mission we can work towards, like digging a 27 kilometer tunnel under the... Remember that CERN was founded, like I said, in 54, in the ashes of the Second World War, where there was a lot of animosities within groups in Europe. And this was a European lab. And so, yeah, th this is this is exactly the point. Right. Uh, speaking of that, what, what was CERN like sort of in the early days when it started? You've been there a long time. How was yeah, it sort I wasn't of a... there in the early days? No, no, no. <laughs> I'm not assuming you're that old. I'm, That's I'm right. Not, but in the, in, the 80s, <laughs> in the 80s, CERN was already a large laboratory by any standard and with already, you know, a very vibrant program, many accelerators. You know, it was already a mature laboratory with a lot of strength. So when I joined... You know, when I first arrived there, I was overwhelmed by the what was available there and how you know how large it was. And of course, by today's standard, it it's it it, it was probably much it was much smaller, and uh, there were less people involved. But it was nevertheless already a sizable laboratory compared to what I'd seen before in university settings. Or, but I didn't have a lot of experience with international labs. There there are others not as big as CERN, but at the time there were other lab, big labs that, that, you know, were similar size, still are. And, but I wasn't aware of all of this. So for me, this was like the environment that I worked in. Eventually later, when I became older, I realized that, well, CERN was quite unique um, in that, in the size. Now, what that meant, it meant that um, I worked at the time in the eighties in a collaboration um, this is before Atlas. This is the collaboration that I said that the co-discovered that W and Zebo was on. The, this these collaborations were of order of 100 to 200 people. There were two of them, UA1 and UA2. And um, this was considered humongous at the time, very large collaborations. Most collaborations were smaller. And those were the largest experiment at the time. Uh, and they were uh, around the super proton synchrotron at CERN, which at the time in the early 80s was the largest tunnel built there. It was a seven kilometer circumference tunnel. And that's where I did my PhD and, and an experiment there underground. And, um, but uh, you, you could tell it was a big lab because there was a lot of resources. And so um, the LEP tunnel, so the tunnel that now is where the large Hadron Collider is was uh, built in the 80s and at the time it was the largest civil engineering project in europe it was a big thing 27 kilometer tunnel about 100 meters underground so i was there part during the time that they finished digging the tunnel that was i was at CERN at the time and it did disrupt some of our experiments because they had to blast and do things so i remember that and um and um this new ring initially used LEPs as a large electron positron collider. And for quite a long time, from the late 80s to Christmas 2000, uh, four experiments around that ring did some measurements on electron positron collisions. And those collaborations were quite much larger already, more like 500 people or 
400 people size collaborations. So that brought in a lot more people. So by the early 90s, CERN had already grew significantly in size. So you spoke about these groups of 500 or even 1,000 people working together. And I know myself doing PhD research that working in a group of three or four people can be difficult when it comes to delegating tasks, making sure people do things on time, making sure that you're synced up to do things on time, making promises of uh, when things are delivered and, you know, trying to reduce conflict and um, negative emotions at the same time too. Uh, with 500 or 1,000 people, that that's incredible. What sort of steps and techniques did you use working at CERN and then also just the collaboration itself? How did they set things up in such a way that enabled that kind of incredible collaboration? Yeah, it's a good question. And I'm not sure I'm going to be able to tell you everything about it. But the, I, I, I did see the beginning, very beginning of the Atlas collaboration, which I'm still a member of which is now more than 4,000 people. At the beginning, it was less, but it was still a lot of people. And But this grew on other collaborations before that were of order four or 500 people that grew on collaborations in the early 80s that were already at the level of 100 or 200 people. And so the, in the field of particle physics, and high energy physics in particular, large collaborations have been part of the makeup of the way that we do science since before I was an adult. And so this was not new with, with Atlas. It just reached a different level, but it was not new. So there were tools already that had been developed for this. But clearly, um, things like um, uh, consensus and, and, and coming to decisions for the experiment or for the collaboration, it's always been important. Remember that when you have a company, you have a pyramid of directions and, and um, you know, there's a, a boss or two, and then you have got lightnings and then you get people doing the work and and it's very hierarchical um experiments at CERN especially the ones like Atlas or CMS which are the other experiments around the large Hadron collider doing general proton proton collision physics these large collaboration have um you know um how can I put this um they've had to put together um rules in order to allow people from of the order of 100 institutes to collaborate on a large project. So how do you do this? Well, consensus building is important and you need to build trust with people, but you also have to remember that in these large experiments, the way that the hierarchy is, is not so much like in the business. It's more like you have an army of generals. So you can't really give orders to a lot of people because remember that these big, like a big Atlas experiment was built by people from around the world, but the money to build these detectors came from, you know, 50 different funding agencies around the world. And so there's nobody at CERN that can dictate or give orders to, to people what to do. And so this makes people from the business area wonder how we can do what we do. And it's a fair question. The answer is a lot of consensus building, a lot of coordination, a lot of meetings where people exchange ideas. You have to be very open to other people's point of view and views. Try to keep it, always keep it uh, scientific arguments. And amazingly, the vast majority of the time when there is a conflict of different ideas, people will rally behind the one that can be proven to be the best scientifically. Right, that's something beautiful. In the ideal world, this is what this is how you would want to make decisions. Of course, it's never ideal, but in the making of these large collaborations, this is as close to that ideal as you can be, I think, in any spheres of activity, you know, by humans. Because usually there's always conflict, and then it's usually it's strength or a decision-making process that involves a few people making decisions for everyone and enforcing it. And, and it's really not the way it works here. Well, you said something beautiful. You said that CERN is like an army of generals. Well, and it's I think, a bit of a joke saying that well, you, know, you, you don't you don't have one general and then a bunch of soldiers. It's really, you have a lot of big bosses from all universities. And they also have their teams, of course, and they can, do the, they can deal with that the way they want. But it's really an army of generals with a lot of people working with them. But when you see everybody around you as no one is superior, even if someone's giving orders, 
to see everybody in that light of like, hey, we're all an army of generals here. We're all working towards a common goal. It, it's it's still a hierarchy. But once you accept, once you sort of say like, hey, we're all sort of in the same thing, someone's taking a leadership position just to make things run more smoothly. Like I said, consensus building and coordination, that, mm -hmm. that is the key. It's not easy to do. I'm not saying it's easy. Um, but it's true that I was always impressed as a young man learning the ropes when I was doing my PhD and going to CERN regularly that, um, you know, it didn't matter whether you were a 23-year-old PhD student or a 60-year-old professor with a lot of experience or some famous CERN staff, even Nobel Prize winners that we would go and have lunch with. Everybody is so open and easy access. There was very few exceptions to that rule. They always make you feel comfortable. You were always allowed to ask questions. Your opinion was, you know, respected. And that kind of environment was fostered by very good scientists that, that had leadership position in these laboratories. I can name a few, but you know, they people that really impressed me in their skills to allow this kind of environment to flourish. And, and I was fortunate to, to see this in action. Right. And, and tried to emulate this in my own career, but not, not always easy. But it it was pretty remarkable to see this going. And there were tensions, there were difficult moments, but there were was enough goodwill and enough people with enough skills to manage this that uh, solutions were found and compromises were found and, and people moved forward with uh, with agreements. Right. And I, I was there for uh, the summer after my third year of undergrad. And one thing, one thing I think that I think maybe the general public sort of perceives, at least I perceived before going there, was I thought, okay, I'm going to a big scientific collaboration. Everyone is there to do science from 8 a.m. in the morning till 9 p.m. at night, go to sleep and do science. And I had this idea of what these, you know, scientists were like and um, the other summer students there as well. And everybody was, they, they had the most diverse set of hobbies. Like people were going hiking every weekend. People would go down uh, to Lake Geneva and swim or go biking around uh, sort of the, the France mountains area. Um, when you were at CERN, besides the sort of science-based, you know, obviously, everyone's working really hard to, to do the experiment. How did people sort of relax and, and do fun activities on the side? What, 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 how was that culture at CERN sort of like? Oh, I thought it was wonderful. Uh, and in my experience, uh, we had a closed circuit of friends, people of similar ages, like grad students and postdoctoral fellows that would, uh, you know, work very hard together and also go out and do other things together. And, um, it's true that a lot of the activity, I mean, you have to remember that CERN is a place where people come from all over the world, you know, and I was, there not, were not many Canadians, when I, well, there were a few, but not many, most people from European countries, and there were some Americans as well, more than Canadians, but, you know, there were people from all over the place, and for all these people, and me included, the CERN and Switzerland and all this area of the world, and all their food and their ways was all new and foreign. Everything, doorknobs, anything, anything would look bizarre <laughs> when I arrived in Geneva, right? Everything looks strange, everything. You know, the way the windows open in my bedroom, you know, I just thought, wow, I've never seen a window like that. So little things like that, I could just, it's amazing. So um, so people had to group together in order to do activities and, and, you know, and explore. So one big thing was to explore the area. And so take the trains to go in Switzerland and go hiking in the mountains or go and visit some towns or... So this was common. A lot of people did that because it was readily available. Uh, Switzerland is a fantastic train system and we could go various places when we had the time. Um, uh, skiing in the winter, that was also a big deal for a lot of people. Not everybody skis, but a lot of people did. That seems like a real particle physics thing. I know at the conferences we have in Canada too, there's always skiing as a part of the... Yeah, and then because you're in an area that has these fantastic ski resorts and mountains and it was nearby. I mean, Chamonix is an hour's drive from CERN Lab and you're there and then, you know, the, the Alps. And, and so this was a big attraction for foreigners that were at CERN. And a lot of the, I would say most of the scientists that I interacted with when I was a young uh, guy there um, were fairly athletic, really liked sports and getting out and um so skiing running mountaineering in the summer uh was a big deal i i personally did all of that i mean i did skiing i did long distance running and and mountaineering and, and all this and traveling and, and those you know this is fantastic way to learn the area and and of course but there's a lot of other things that people also do other i mean there's people that do music and 
you know, read books, uh, you could do anything you want. But that, I think, in the group of people I was interacting with, this was very common. It, um, but the way to work, ethic work, is that you you had a lot of, um, uh, it was work hard, play hard, I guess. I mean, it, sometimes we had to work three months, seven days a week, you know, it's very long days, sometimes very, sometimes all around 24 hours just to get, to get things to go so there were times where you really had to, to concentrate and especially when we had beam and collisions and detector at the run and then we had shifts and and we were in charge of parts of the detector and then you couldn't go anywhere you had to work for to make it work but it was very exciting and we didn't feel it we didn't feel it was like a chore but then you know after doing something like that you would take a week off and go and do something and and then there was a lot of possibilities to explore in the area for sure I Paris remember so Paris was not very far. You could take a, a TGV train for less than three and a half hours and, and get to Paris from Geneva. And the, a lot of people wanted to go and visit places like that. I remember visiting the, the control room. Um, I think it might have been the Atlas control room. So Atlas is um we can talk about that in a bit as well. Atlas is one of the big detector experiments at CERN. Um and seeing all the monitors and seeing the grad students there with their cups of coffee. Um monitoring to make sure the beam wasn't exploding at that point in time and I, I, I being in there you really felt the energy and the history of everything that would have gone on in that room all the disappointment and all the um happiness too when things worked out i know obviously it's not a linear increase to just pure success there's obviously ups and downs and um i know uh speaking of ups and downs when the Large Hadron Collider was first turned on in 2008. There was an issue, and um, you can maybe go into a bit more depth about that because I, I don't know a lot about that, but something, some issue with the magnets where you had to take a almost a two-year hiatus to, to fix the experiment. Um, what was that like? Well, you know, it threw out the... LHC uh, project, if I start from the 80s, there was a timeline as to when we think we would get first beam. And this is important, first collision, because it means that it sets the scale of the, it sets the timing for the people that build the collider itself. So magnets, tunnels, everything else, it's complicated business. And then people like me that work on preparing and constructing the experiment that, or one of the experiments that will be at one of the collision points around the ring. And but the challenge is that the, sh the schedule kept shifting because, you know, it's, it's you don't buy these things on the shelf, uh, off the shelf. They're unique devices and unique contraptions. So they, they take longer than people think. And so we're delays, delays, and delays. And for a long time, we thought the LHC would start in 2004 and then 2005 and then 2007. And I remember 2008 at some point was supposed to be the date and everything was on Kidori. It was supposed to work. And so the last four or five years, we, we knew it should start in 2008. So it was very difficult for the people building the detectors to meet that deadline and to be ready when the beam would start. And so we worked very hard to get everything built at that time. And same thing for the large you know, collider and the, the, the collider itself. So the magnets and all the engineering that had to go with it. And so when 2008 arrived and first collisions were to be attempted, the magnets were turned on one at a time in the sectors per sectors around the ring. Everything worked very well until the very last sector that was turned on and tested. It's and always the very the, last one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's true. It, it, it was, remember, there are thousands of magnets around this ring. It's, this is a complicated device. In fact, it's the most, it's the biggest machine ever built. And so what happened is that there was, these are superconducting magnets with very high currents. And there's cryogenics. The whole thing runs at 1.9 degrees Kelvin. So this is colder than outer space. You know, it's, it's an amazing sort of technology. And at some pl place, a connection between two magnets, something went wrong with the, the superconducting connection, which then uh, quenched. So there was the current going through, we had to dissipate the heat somewhere. And that led to um, damage, physical damage, Bit like a small explosion um, in the in the part of the ring, and for I think a hundred to two hundred meters section of the tunnel, there was damage, physical damage. Some of the equipment was lifted up there. You know, they 
their their support and um and uh this of course was a big disappointment and nobody got injured as far as i know but the the rebuild of that took two years and was costly and so there was a lot of work to understand the, this the problem the what what had happened people did some beautiful forensic work on the equipment and tested everything and so i had to have a thorough understanding of what went wrong so go, going back to the moment when it happened that day or night or whenever mm-hmm. it was um what was it like were, were you there at the time or did, did you but know no, i was there? not physically there at the time remember i'm not there all the time because i'm teaching at victoria but i, I used to go there often for various tasks but I, I don't believe i was there at the time but of course we're connected and we find out right away and um and I, we, you know, I seem to remember that we had students um, and postdoctoral fellows from our team that were based there. And so we have direct connection with the people there all the time. And of course, that was a big disappointment because you have to remember that some of these people, uh, well, many of the people have been involved in this project for a long time, by that time, more than 20 years. And some of the students have been preparing their, their graduate work on the basis that they would get data starting in 2008. And that delayed their, they knew that this would delay their graduate work by at least a year or two, which it did. And so there was a lot of uh, disappointment at that time, um, clearly. Um, that's, uh, there was a moment where we we're not sure how long it would take to be able to have BEAM again. Is it the end of it? Is it going to take 10 years? I mean, what is it? Right. So there was a moment of uh, a period of anxiety there. I don't remember how long it lasted, but eventually a schedule, I mean, people understood the problem was there was a plan laid out. There's a lot of very competent people at CERN to, when there's, you know, to deal with something like this. And um, it was eventually fixed and understood, it took a lot of work uh, by dedicated people to do this. And the good news is when it started again in 2010, it, it worked beautifully. Yeah. There's something sort of, awesome about that that you know people obviously working on their own research or whatever goal they're on in life you know um run into issues like that all the time and just knowing that you can take ten thousand of some of the smartest people on earth even they'll make a mistake sometimes and you know what they have that mistake they use it to their advantage they build an even better system they repair it and then it ends up working in the end and so i mean it's a it's a very complex device there were pressures to to various pressures to to be ready at that time remember the project had been delayed before many times but you know it's possible that things went a little too quick and then but it was it's it's it was not an obvious type of bug you know it was it was um it's a very complicated engineering project and failure is going to happen and so it did, but it got fixed, and then and it worked. Aside. I think I think it's amazing that it worked at all in 2010. I mean, it just shows that it's pretty impressive. This is a prototype, right? This, 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 there's only one of them. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah. And then, so that extra period of two years, we didn't just sit around and sulk and you know, and and wonder what to do. We were very very busy, um, taking the extra time to uh, then properly make sure that our detectors were ready. And with insight, we realized that we were not ready. Even if the beam had been colliding flawlessly in 2008, our detectors were not completely ready for this. It would have been a long teething period where we would have wasted some of the beam anyway. And so these two years were used very, uh, it was very fruitful. Uh, we use cosmic rays coming from the sky as the particles that go through the detector. And we can use that to calibrate and test many aspects of our detector. So these are particles that actually come from outer space and hit the detector. You don't even need to build a a big pipe. You cannot use those to do physics with the experiment, but you can use it to sort of see whether your detector has some parts that works and timing and electronics and readout. And and all of this, the two years were very beneficial. And so by the time that the beam started in 2010, the experiments were really ready. And that's the main reason why it took less than two years then to discover the Higgs boson, right? I mean, this is remarkable. And the main, so this this, um, um, incident, uh, 2008, in a way, I think probably made the discovery happen faster. We'll never know for sure, but it's, it's possible that that's the case. Right. So having that patience when, when something happens and realizing in your own life, you know, if there's something goes wrong, 
how you can use that to, you know, um, be patient, don't be frantic, realize that there's um, maybe it gives you more time to work on other things as well. Be better prepared. Yeah. Be That's better so. prepared. But you know, was... there were no guarantees. I mean, it could have been that it would have not worked in 2010 and then take another five years. It could have happened. I mean, these are complicated, complicated experiments, complicated machine. Right. So you were you were in that valley in 2008 when everything went wrong, but uh, things got better. But then four years later, 2012, uh, the Atlas Collaboration publishes one of the most, probably one of the most influential papers of all time. And certainly it's got more authors than, I think it's got more authors than than words in that paper. If you look through <laughs> the, the first list, there's there's every yeah, name. Well, first there's the, the Atlas experiment, but also the CMS experiment. There are two experiments sitting opposite position on the ring that um, both confirm the same measurement. Um, there was an agreement between the spokespersons of these two experiments and the director of the laboratory, a certain laboratory. So, so what, what was this measurement and why, why was this so important to big build this huge detector? Like what, what was well, this the, measurement? The large, hadron, the large hadron collider, uh, was built to, uh, as an exploratory machine. So in order to explore the laws of nature at a higher energy level or at smaller scales, it looks it's like a microscope looking at very small scales. And um, the idea was to, uh, the thrust behind all of this was, of course, the search for the Higgs boson, which I could talk more about. A, it was the missing piece in what's called the standard model of particle physics and our understanding of all the forces in the universe. But it's also a machine that allows a lot more exploration. While the Higgs boson discovery was the thrust and and um drove a lot of the design of the experiments it was not the only goal there were other goals like the search for supersymmetry which we still haven't found um or are there are, are there extra spatial dimensions or why is there three species of neutrinos and these questions there are many questions like this that this machine was built in order to explore a lot of that um that domain and it and in that sense, it has so far delivered delivered brilliantly. I mean, it's a machine that really allows a lot of explorations. Now, when you explore, you may or may not find something. And so, so you never know what's going to happen. The Higgs boson was very well motivated. It, it was the piece that Higgs mechanism is a mechanism by which theorists thought that nature could generate fundamental mass of particles without violating some symmetries that we think are the source of all the forces that we know in the universe. And so this was a big deal that there was a, um, a mathematical way that was found to deal with this. Physics is really philosophy. The equations are just there to write it down. And so the Higgs mechanism is a way to deal with this um, conundrum, but it was a postulate. It wasn't verified. There are analogous situations in solid state physics. So it, it was not, it was built by analogy to other things that were already known, but we didn't know if the universe as a whole worked like that. So this is a particle that gives mass to other well, particles. The Higgs mechanism is a, is a mechanism that involves more than just the Higgs particle, but that generates the mass, fundamental mass of particles like uh, the electron mass or the W boson, the Z boson's mass and the quark, the mass, the quarks, not the mass of a proton or your mass, but more the fundamental masses of particles, uh, elementary particles. And, um, and this is very important because that, that, that's otherwise we wouldn't be where we are. All the laws depend on the masses that the particles have. And so, but we didn't know how that was possible. So the Higgs mechanism allows this to be possible. And the Higgs boson is like the signature that this mechanism actually took place. There's this one particle that is like a consequence of this Higgs mechanism. So the Higgs boson, the particle itself, is is a is um, an indication that the uh, Higgs mechanism took place in the universe, which is amazing, which is completely amazing. So that's why it's such such an important piece. So the Higgs boson is the as any particle is a quantum of excitation of a fundamental fundamental field in the universe, and so we've discovered a new field in the universe, the the the, the boson field, the Higgs boson field, which is which permeates all of space, like like the electromagnetic field or 
you know, and, and then, so it's a new component of the universe that we found. And this was theorized long before the discovery was made. Oh, yeah, roughly when I was born in the early 60s. In the 60s. So it took about six or yeah, 50, 60 years to discover that. Well, and because it's a very, very elusive particle that requires you know, a lot of the energy to produce, which was not available in the early colliders or, ex or fixed target experiments. And it also required very large and sophisticated detectors to be able to see. So it builds on decades of knowledge that was acquired in our field in order to get to that, you know, measurement. In fact, in the early, in the seventies, there were theorists that said, it's hopeless. You're never going to be able to measure this. You might as well not even bother. And then within 10 years, people said, well, let's look for it anyway. And then, and then that's how the whole quest started. And so at CERN, there was the Atlas detector, obviously looking for it, but then totally separate. There was a, a totally another independent experiment, CMS, that was looking for the same result. Yeah. And and I remember, yeah. I, also at CERN at the other end of the ring. Yeah. And I remember you talking about this before that these two experiments set out to do the same thing, but they were developed entirely independently from each other, that any of the technology being done in one or the other, the scientists didn't share things between each other because they wanted to get the same oh, independent no, no. results. It's a lot of sharing. It's not, no, that's the way, not the way it works. The, the collaboration were set to, uh, it was deemed that two was a, a good number to have to do general purpose experiments around the ring. There are two other experiments that do more specialized physics around the LHC ring, but let's focus on Atlas and CMS, which are the ones that were exploratory devices. Think about them as very fancy cameras that look at the collisions. And um, at the very beginning, before Atlas and CMS were given names, there was a, and I remember that meeting, this is, I was there, that, that was in Evian in 1992, March, 1992. There was a meeting where people were proposing detectors to go around the large hydro collider and there were proto collaborations if you want it was a big meeting with 500 people and that's where the first ideas of what kind of detector we could build around that ring um and there were four proposals and at the end of that process two of those proposals were asked to merge and make the atlas experiment and then another one was allowed to move forward as was as, as is the CMS and another one was not was not was was um, not allowed to go forward and that's how Atlas and CMS started and so by October 1992 the Atlas experiment was born if you want this is when we started as a collaboration but but people have been doing research and development since the 80s me included uh, to build the knowledge and the uh, detector technologies and uh, that would be then the building blocks of those detectors. So when those two collaborations merged to make Atlas, was there compromises that had to be made for oh, yes. both groups? Absolutely. And the decision also was made in such a way that these two detectors, Atlas and CMS, would have complementary technologies so that one could really explore different ways of detecting these particles and have... Um, and use this also as a development bed for different technologies. And so while the Atlas and CMS detectors share the same goals, they were built with different designs and different emphasis and, and, and different ideas. And, right. and there was collaboration. I mean, we had the research and development teams that involved people from all experiments and people that were not in any of those experiments. So there was a lot of collaboration. So, yeah. And so ideas were circulating freely. It's just that people decided to build different devices. There was right. no, I mean, we knew what they were building. In fact, we were very keen to learn what they were using, what design they'd come up with and what was their ideas. So it was a very exciting time to try to understand what the others were doing too. Right. And to get the same measurement from two sort of, I guess, not totally independent, but, you know, Different, different experiments. Yeah, different devices. It's like if you take two teams and they build different cameras and, you know, and they, they come up and they see the same thing. Right. In reality, you, you like to think it's one thing and you're trying to look at it. And so that we, and, but it's good to have two because you do experiments because then you can confirm that it's not just a fluke or, and so on that point, this is interesting because the director of CERN and the community knew that this could be important historical moments with the Large Hadron Collider program. And so there was already some agreement that if a collaboration 
had a hint of a signal of something new, that there would be a meeting between the director of CERN and the spokespersons of each one of those experiments to allow for a finite period of time of order of a week to allow for the others that didn't see the signal to check their data to see if they could see it too. And if the answer is yes, then the publication will be done jointly, two separate papers, but at the same time. And if not, then one would you know, publish and the other one would say, we don't see it. And so that was good because this means that you can have, you avoid to have infighting at the last minute for who's going to publish first or things like this. But it does mean that if an experiment is prepared and can see it, then they, you know, the other doesn't, the other doesn't see it after a week or something, then, then you could publish. And so that took place with the Higgs signal and both collaborations saw it about exactly the same level of precision. Not surprisingly, they had about the same amount of data. And um, yeah, and then and then there were independent measurements, so they could be combined to produce this this five sigma uh, precision. In fact, the five sigma was reached more practically reached by each experiment at that time. So by five sigma, there you mean if you drew a Gaussian bell curve, the probability of getting a result that extreme, if the Higgs boson didn't exist, is five sigmas away from the center. Yeah, so it's a small; it's less than a part per million that you would get this randomly just by noise. So from my understanding in most science, things like, for example, what I do now, medical physics or, or medicine, you're looking two, three sigma for results, but particle physics has had a very strict standard. Very high. Yeah, two, three sigma. Two, two, two sigma, we don't get excited in particle physics. Three sigma, we, we, we say we have evidence for something, but it needs scrutiny and it needs to be better measured. And we have a term for that. We say evidence for something, but we don't call it a discovery. We require five sigma for discovery. And this bar is very high because you're building building blocks of fundamental measurements here. And so it's a different field. But you're right. In other fields, the, the excitement happens with lower statistical significance, which is unfortunate sometimes, but that's the way it is. But it means so that every very high bar, yeah. Every, every 100 studies, if you're dealing with sort of two sigma, you know, chances are one's going to find yeah, two sigma sigma result. Is 25%, right? So yeah, percent of the time, you'll get a two sigma effect just from fluctuations. So with something like CERN, where you're making many, many, many measurements, and I know that this is an issue that some statisticians talk about sometimes, is that, you know, you can set a five sigma rule, or you could set a rule for, you know, how um, unlikely something would have to be under normal conditions to accept it as something new. But when you're making many, many, many measurements, especially now with CERN testing for all these different things, um, different particles that people theorize or, or, or parameters of some sort of equation, when you're doing thousands of different tests, there's, there's bound to be some uh, false positive um, conclusions there. Um, how does the collaboration deal with the fact that that, that sort of Ish, the fundamental issue, I guess, with statistics that we're dealing with now. Uh, physicists are pretty happy with this. I mean, the, the problem that often the public is public doesn't have, don't have necessarily a good grasp of what we mean by probabilities and chances and things like this. Um, you know, it's not an obvious concept. You, you, it's very abstract. But with COVID and people saw a lot of graphs, I think there's been a bit more um, interest by the general public into these kind of mathematical modeling and, and probabilities and statistics and significance of results and that kind of thing. But but for a scientist, this is the key of a measurement. A, a measurement, if it doesn't have an error bar on it, is meaningless in science. You have to be able, an, an experimental measurement, the value is important, but the error on it is even more important. And so we've developed sophisticated, advanced ways to understand our errors that is the most important thing. You know, that's what we used to do. For, used to say for a PhD thesis in particle physics, five percent of the work is to make the measurement, and ninety-five percent of the work is to understand the error on it. And that's probably not uh, an overestimate. And so, uh, but there are types of errors. The statistical errors are the ones the easiest one to deal with because it's mathematically well defined. The ones which are harder to deal with are the systematic errors. The ones which are due to biases in the experiment, biases in your analysis, potentially, or electronics errors, or you know other things that that could 
you know, temperature changes somehow and you get other effects. So all of these systematic errors have to be controlled and that more, a, most of the effort goes into those. And that requires a lot of experience and a lot of, and it's not uniquely defined. I mean, you really have, what you have to do is convince your peers that you've done a thorough job at understanding your systematic errors. The rest is very, fairly well mathematically defined. But systematic errors is a big challenge and the biggest part of our work. And so we use different techniques to understand them, including using our own data to verify various errors that could happen. And so we, so yeah, so this is a big deal in our measurements. Right, right. And obviously now, um, besides from the the statistics aspect, there's there's lots of new advances in things like artificial intelligence now with like uh, things like chat GPT, large language models, um, et cetera. Um, besides from large language models, like putting them aside for a little bit, obviously AI is a very diverse field consisting of many different sort of applications. Um, how is Atlas and CERN, you know, dealing with this AI explosion and are they proactively trying to integrate using AI in their experiment? Uh, okay, I, I don't think I know everything about this, but one thing I can tell you is that already in the early 90s, there were people looking at neural network based classifiers, you know, in particle physics. So it's not like if this, this is a new idea. In fact, they were already used in industry in the 90s. So neural networks and these kind of uh, ways to classify or make decisions on data sets already existed. It's just that the computer power and the access to large memories were not as powerful as today. And so I remember the first time I started learning about neural networks is in 1992. And there was a little suite of programs written in Fortran to play with this. And then I, you know, enthusiastically look into that, but quickly lost interest because you couldn't really use them with the machines we have. They, they were, it was still required too much computing power to be of any use. So it was an overkill and it dropped an interest. And it's only in the, in the recent past that it has resurfaced for various reasons. And, and now, of course, it's taking on um, more, much, more, much more importance. But you know, we use it often in our analyses now as ways to classify or you know, look for signals in large data sets that might have backgrounds in them. Um, I'm not sure where this is going to lead. But right now, for most physicists, artificial intelligence, or let's call it neural networks type of um, fitting devices, or you want to call, I call them fitting devices, but they're really like, uh, for us, they're like classifiers. For us, they're more like another algorithm to try to fit our data to signal and background. They're like a different black box. They're very powerful. It does give better results, but we do also throw at them more power than we used to. We have, these models have more internal parameters have been adjust. So it's not so surprising that they give better results. Now, what you're asking is, would AI then play a role in designing our experiments and doing other things? I'm not, I'm not so sure about that, but it may be, maybe we'll have to see. Well, it's interesting because I know for large language models like ChatGPT, they're trained on, you know, big repositories of text, things like Wikipedia, for example. Um, they've been trained uh, trained on Stack Exchange. So any coding problems, they, they learn to code really well. But they don't always seem to be great at logic. And so an, in, an interesting thing is if you try to multiply, for example, two four-digit numbers together in ChatGPT, it just won't give the right answer because there's something about it can learn to create um, language-like responses to humans, but it's not able to learn the rules of logic from human text like from wikipedia or whatever it, it can't quite put together okay carry the and sometimes you could say like look pay attention to the you know you multiply four two four digit numbers together you could say look make sure you mention every time you carry the number remember these rules i mean it's been written about online how to carry you know the i haven't done this in a long time but you know carry the one or whatever and, and do a, a subtraction or multiplication problem um they're not quite able it seems to learn those kind of logic rules. And so, so moving on from there, you know, people say, okay, well, one day it might be AI that's developing these new 
laws of physics. You know, may maybe one day us as humans are going to be worse at, you know, deriving new laws of physics, setting up experiments to um, uh, test laws of physics as well. Um, what are your opinions on something like AI taking the role as a human when it comes to... Um... Well, I'm, 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 of course, very skeptical because, you know, I have a fairly good idea of what's, what's inside an AI algorithm. I'm not an expert, but, you know, there's, there's no magic in them. And, you know, there are limitations, but, but you're right. There are people that are looking into ways of um, doing architecture, uh, the neural network architecture or... Um, learning architectures that could potentially be able to extract laws like mathematical laws, like F equal MA for Newton's laws um, from a body of data. Uh, so it's not impossible. Like you said, one day these, these connections could be made. Um, but again, we have to, we have, uh, to me, I think there's a confusion between like if you do languages, this is like a type of complexity problem, but then logic is a different one. Can we, cook up an algorithm that could deal with both of them at the same time, the way that our brain seems to be able to do. I'm not sure. It's possible. Um, so at the moment, I'm, I'm a bit skeptical about how far it can go. Now, whether I'd like to know or not is a different matter, but it, it, it um, I think it's, I think it's quite possible that, that it, you could, you could extract hypothesis of laws of nature from bodies data set. Well, it's a, it's a philosophical which what, question. Which is what we do, right? Which is what we do in practice. But then we have an iterative technique where we have a law, we think it's all right, and then we try it with other experiments, and then we see, oh, it's not quite good, so we have to do it a little bit better, like you know, special relativity as opposed to Newton. And then we keep that one for a while, and we do more experiments. And so it's a it's a process that takes time and requires a lot of iterative, you know. So AI would could not do faster than humans in the sense of we have to build the experiments. Right. You know, unless you have robots that build experiments, but, but at some point you need this interact all this. Even if you could think in a nanosecond, uh, given a data set, oh, this must be this flaw. You still have to go and test it. You still have to. So there, there's still a lot of work that that needs to be done in terms done. of. So yeah, when it comes to formulating things like new laws of physics and implications, it seems to me like sort of I don't know a whole lot about it, but when you when you think about a an AI learning from bodies of text. And this gets to a deeper question about things like logic and language. The question is, are the rules of logic somehow embedded in our language? And can an AI from taking strings of language somehow learn logical rules and sort of compress them into, you know, rules that it follows and then be able to do that in things like math. And, and my current opinion at the time is that, well, it, it's not even able to do this for multiplying two four digit numbers. So I'm, I'm also very skeptical that one day it will actually be, I mean, I'm sure it will happen 100, 200 years in the future, but the question is how it's going to learn that. I'm not convinced that it can learn that from language alone. It almost seems like logic is Separate from language. Yeah, again, this is not my field of expertise, but there are people that proclaim that languages is like a, a basis upon which that we map reality. So that languages limits and encompasses all you can learn with your head. Okay, maybe this is true, but I'd like to think that that's an exaggeration. I'd like to think that humans can think about mathematics and logic without necessarily knowing a language. Now, maybe there are people that can disprove this, uh, but I, I'd like to think that that's not the case. I think that they're, they're, they're probably connected, but um, maybe that's because I'm somebody that believes that there is a, an objective reality that we're just looking at. Now, of course, language is a way to train your brain to think about things. I mean, we learn language from a young age, and of course it, it must... Um, play a role in the way that our neural network is connected and trained. But I think there's more than that. I think that uh, language is one important aspect, but there's other there's other aspects that are not, I don't think that they can be narrowed down to a language. I mean, people that speak different languages around the world, they all agree on the mathematical symbols that we use today. There's consensus. People do math in different languages and they all understand the math in the same way. 
at least mathematicians. And so does it mean that all these languages, they see math the same way? Or, I mean, uh, that to me, it, it, I, don't, I don't think, I don't think that's, that's correct. It could be that language itself comes from this sort of baseline of logic that people all around the world share and then language forms in similar ways. Um, that's right. It could be the other way around. Like you said, it could be language that springs from a knowledge of logic as opposed to the other way around. Right. So it depends whether you're more of a scientist or more of a human scientist, you know, like what, which, which camp do you give, want to give more weight? I suspect it's a bit of both at the end of the day. Right. I mean, we are limited in some ways by our language. So you, you can tell when you learn a new language, you, there are things that you prefer to express in another language because it's not expressed as well in the other ones. Like when I started to learn German, I knew English and French already. And there were expressions in German that uh, they were better in German. They were that they were not as concise or neat in French or English. And so that does mean that the as subtle aspects of reality can depend on knowledge. Uh, sorry, on 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 language. But but no, I I don't think it's you don't want to go too far into that that direction, I think. Right, right. That's my that's my gut feeling about this. So this might be a loaded question as a, a final sort of question. Um, but as a physicist who's spent your life doing physics, there's, there's a lot of different places that could have big discoveries in physics coming up. This could be things like a uh, new discovery about dark matter, for example, something that exists beyond the standard model. It could have something to do with uh, improving general relativity or even you know some connection between the, the two theories. Um, what do you think is going to be the next... Like, not necessarily based on, I guess, to some extent, based on the past and the discoveries that have been made. Do you think the standard model is going to be proven, I don't want to say wrong, but that it's going to be, it's going to be proven more nuanced, that there's something else, another oh, piece yeah, that sure. needs to be put on? Oh, yes. The, 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 we build knowledge. We keep growing in our knowledge. You know, we don't know everything. And if a scientist tells you that, then they're obviously, you know, not right. We keep learning, and the more question, the more we learn, the more we have questions. So this is a quest, right? I mean, a quest of knowledge, and the standard model of particle physics, which we call like that. This is the our current state of understanding of all the physical laws of nature, excluding gravity, into one model, and then gravity is there on its own as well with general relativity, and you know it's a pretty impressive set of 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 laws that we've devised here based on philosophical principles and then you put the math around it and then you make experiments and they work and some of them like nine nine digits after the the nine digit precision you know or more and it is it's remarkable that we've allowed that we've gotten to a point where we can understand nature so intimately it's just amazing now where is that going to go well no there are many things we don't understand about the standard model of particle physics that that are built into the model its structure, I don't want to get too technical here, but the, the group structure for the gauge group or the number of lepton families, or these are just ad hoc things that come from experiment. We know it's like that, but we don't know why. We don't know, we still don't know why the masses of the particles are what they are. I mean, the fundamental particles. We know how it can be produced with the Higgs mechanism, which is a big deal, but we don't know why they have the values they have. Why is the electron such a mass? Why is the muon 206 times the mass of the electron? Why? why, why where do these numbers come from? So obviously those are just, they're, just, they're, they're from experiments, but they're not predictive in any way. And so we know that there's a lot of unknowns in there. And one is hoping for insights or looking for looking for hints that that there is more structure in the universe that we've seen so far, which so far has always been the case, that we're missing something. And then we make an experiment one day and as we get a result that cannot be explained by our current theories. And then it forces us to dig deeper and to try to understand it. And that's how science has you know, progressed. We're reaching a point where it's harder and harder to extract secrets from the universe. And so the big boson is a big deal, but it still doesn't answer all the questions. And so to keep exploration is the only way to move forward. And some big questions that we have, apart from the ones I just mentioned, which are a bit more technical, is the nature of dark matter, okay? The nature of dark energy. These things we know exist from measurements, 
dark matter in particular, we know very well that it exists. We can actually measure fairly accurately in with cosmology, you know, how much dark matter there is and even where it is to some extent. I mean, it's amazing, but we know nothing about its nature. Very little, we don't know, we don't know anything about its nature. All we know is it interacts gravitationally. And so particle physics may be the place where dark matter will be elucidated. It may not be. Maybe it's going to be found with more measurements in cosmology or astrophysics. At the moment, there are many different types of particle physics experiments to try to understand dark matter. So that, to me, dark matter is still probably one of the biggest questions. But I, I would put a lot of interest also in, um, and this is going to be the, the thrust of the next the continuation of the program of the Large Hadron Collider, which is to better understand the Higgs boson properties, how it interacts with all the other particles, and to scrutinize this in detail, because we're just skimming the surface at the moment. We've discovered this new particle. We've made some measurements on it. Some of them are fairly precise. We know it's mass better than a percent, but many others are not very well measured. And uh, and what's amazing is that the standard model is very easily falsifiable. The, the mass of the Higgs boson was the only bit that was not predicted. Once you know the mass of the Higgs boson, and like I said, we know it now, everything else, how the Higgs boson interacts with everything else, all the other particles, many different things. All of this is uniquely defined. So if you make experiments and you measure all these different properties of the Higgs boson, and, and if you, you suffice it so that you find one of them that doesn't agree with the model, and then your model is wrong. Now, so far, amazingly, and that's, I think it's been a big surprise for everyone, is that not only have we discovered the Higgs boson, but all the properties of this particle that we've measured so far, and there are quite a few, all agree within errors with what's predicted by the standard model, given the mass that we found. This is amazing, it's truly amazing. But the devil's in the details in these experiments, and we have to, so the, the thrust now is to, to dig deeper and to really make those measurements more precise better than you know five percent or a few percent in some of the measurements which is not the case now we don't have enough data you know it's just too rare to produce so that's that's one of the big thrust um and that's uh also related to the shape of this um, higgs potential which which has also an interesting very important connection with the very early phase of the universe and so all this you know the infinitely small and the infinitely large really get together with the kind of physics that we do I find the interplay with the cosmology measurements of dark matter and, and its need to understand the current structure of the universe, large scale structure of the universe, um, and the, the connection between that and um, you know how it can be a particle and, and be visible in, in, as a particle in, in the universe, say in particle physics. I see these two connections to be fascinating, but we don't know yet, right? We, we don't know. If dark matter does not interact in any other way than gravitationally, then we'll never be able to measure its properties in particle physics experiments. But right. most people, most people believe, and I mean it's a, it's a hypothesis, that it's not the case. That it must be a quantum of excitation of some other field that permeates the universe, and we still have we just haven't found it yet. So we spoke a lot about physics today and the, the theories that go on here. Um, but a lot of people who are probably watching this video are sort of early on in their careers. They might be in undergrad or uh, going through master's or PhD programs. Uh, what do you think the most important piece of advice to a young physicist is? How can they um, mentally brace for how difficult things are going to be? How can they can prepare themselves and you know really be a good physicist? Yeah, I know, I'm putting you on the spot here. <laughs> well, you have to be committed. I mean, you have to know that that's what you want to do. Um, and the, the career as a physicist may involve, I mean, if you want to be a researcher and continue research in physics, well, you know, you're, you're going into a career that will, will be um, pulled forward by the, your love of the fundamental laws of the universe so, and then teaching that, that excitement. Um, and, Okay, so if you're not committed to that, and if it's this is not what turns you on, then uh, you know you you should seek another type of career, make more money or whatever. But but research is a is a, a vocation. It's something that you really need to really like. So you have to ask yourself before you do a PhD: Is it really what I want to do? 
you could make a very good career out of this and live pretty well. But it's not like, you know, you know, going into a private enterprise and succeeding and making, you know, making millions of dollars. It's not going to be exactly the same thing. But you have, so you have to be committed and you have to know that that's what you want to do. So um, I think that we're in, we're, we're still in very exciting times. And people say, oh, we've discovered everything. And now there's, you know, there's, it's going to be harder and harder to make discovery in science. I don't think that's true. People have been saying the same thing a hundred years ago. And so, and they missed completely that, oh, yeah, it's quantum mechanics coming and relativity <laughs> coming and all these revolutions that completely change our lives. And so I think we could be poised to another revolution of that kind. But we need young brains and young ideas to sort of, you know, take it to the next level. There are already some ideas about doing, you know, accelerating particles with much, much higher gradients, much smaller devices, as opposed to, like, if you want to probe smaller in the laws of the universe, you need more energy particle collisions. And you you can, with conventional means that we now know today, today, the machines have to be very, very large, you know, 100 kilometers around or something. And this, at some point, doesn't scale anymore. So you have to start to think about completely different ways of doing it. So that one way is by looking at different accelerating techniques. Other ways are completely different, like um, to use quantum mechanics, quantum systems, so quantum optics in general, and do very, very precise measurements, which is possible now, incredibly precise measurements, where you could be sensitive to new physics at a very small scale, but not by using very high energy, just by being very, very precise. There's already a proposal for experiments like this. And this doesn't require, this can be done on a small lab, you know, the size of a room. Doesn't need a huge. And so there are other ideas like this that um, that need to be, you know, looked at and developed further. And people are working on this. And these ideas l lie in the new up and coming undergrad and graduate yeah, students. And, and the new technologies, new ideas. And then, but the questions have to be there. That's the question. The scientific questions are the ones that drives us. But so you have to be willing to question things to go into research you have to have that mindset you have to have you have to be curious as to why things work the way they are and not everyone is like that way that's a hard mindset to be in i think yeah. just if you're questioning everything all the time you know that that, that might be hard to turn that part of your brain right. off when you're not doing science it can drive when you insane a kid, i always wanted to know how things work why why atoms do what they do why is a grain of salt like a little cube or something well why is that you know these are questions that have you know trouble a lot of people. And then, and so you go to science because of these things, right? And then you try to understand them. And that's this is broad. You, people are interested in life, you know, what, what, why plants grow a certain way, you know, genetics, and there's just tons of things. And these are all based on questions. You want to understand how things work. Particle physics is just the fundamental, it's the very fundamental aspects of physical reality that we're interested in. And that's, that's our corner. And, and it, like I said, it, it's infinitely small, infinitely large are together in this. So it is intimately connected with the birth of the universe and how it expanded and how it evolves. So that's why it's fascinating. I think the, the whole thing. And you're dealing with reality. I mean, these, we're not inventing those particles. They're there for us to discover or measure or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we're really exploring. We are. And, and, and so physics is, um, physics last arbiter is nature. We, we make, it's an experimentally based science. There are theoretical physicists that build models and that's necessary, but, but at the end of the day, you got to make a measurement. And so, and you can have a beautiful theory and you make a measurement. And if the measurement disagree with your theory and you can prove that and by multiple measurements reproducible, then uh, the theory is bad and you just have to throw it away. And so the physics is like that. You know, we build knowledge by making models and then understanding reality. And that means that you are constantly have to learn and unlearn and learn and unlearn new things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, that gymnastic that we're trained with is, is what makes general physicists maybe better equipped than others at um, um, learning something new or, or thinking outside the box. Because that's what we have to do all the time when we learn physics. So... Uh, it's not only in physics that you have to do, you can do that, but in physics in particular, you always, you know, you learn, you learn classical mechanics, Newton's laws, and then one day you think, oh, you understand all oh, that's great. You know, you can throw a ball in the air and you know how it spins, you can calculate everything. And then suddenly somebody tells you, well, uh, you know, Newton was wrong, actually. It's, it's Einstein, special relativity. You have to now think about, oh, why is that? And then everything you learn seems to be wrong. And then you have to 
unlearn and relearn something new. And then you realize that, well, Newton wasn't wrong. It was just, he was not completely correct. <laughs> and then you keep growing your knowledge like this. But this exercise and always questioning and being uh, uh, being uh, on, the, on the lookout for um, errors and, and new ideas is, is, is this plasticity is what's very important, I think, for progress. And, you know, so physicists that have a training in that, they, they can then, after a degree, often... In fact, most people that finish with a physics degree don't continue in pure research like I did. They go into various activities and various field, professional fields that uh, where they use their, you know, logic skills and problem solving skills, or sometimes computing skills or mathematical skills, to uh, good use. Right. So, but I think I think you really have to to be committed if you want to go into into physics. But it's a beautiful world. There's a lot of fantastic things to learn. And if you are committed, if you do think that way, and then it's it's such a fun, fulfilling career. But it's very hard. It's a lot of work. But you know, I never got bored in my job, and <laughs> <laughs> and you know, uh, after now, you know, more than thirty-two years of prof, and I still get a real good kick out of teaching. I love teaching. I love interacting with young people and seeing them learning, see them learn things. Try to try to catch as many different modes of learning in my teaching. So that's a challenge, very interesting part of my life, which I haven't talked about much. And the research is another big aspect that allows collaboration, getting together to solve big problems and finding you know, solutions to practical problems in our experiments. Because most of the time we don't think about equations and grand abstract things. Most of the time we deal with computer programs that don't work or electronics component that fail or collaboration matters that don't work or we need to get money from a grant you need to write a grant spend a month the summer to write a grant request i mean in practice we do what a lot of people do we just there's a lot of grant work well uh, speaking of your different speaking of your excitement in the field i remember i came to uvic which is the of course the university you teach at in high school and i remember how excited you were about the material and passionate too and well, i think a lot of a, that a high school student at one of our event yeah, I was one of the high school students and that really drove me towards physics because it seemed to be this career where, you know, y you always have this exciting new frontier. There's always this mission. There's something you have to do. Absolutely. And it gives you a and purpose. It's, and it's never ending. And it keeps people excited and, and everyone who's there loves it. You know, no no one's, very few people I feel like are in physics because they they don't like it. So if you do like it and you join and you have all these other people that love what they do, and are there to find truth and collaborate together. There, there is something beautiful about not only the not only the stuff you're learning, but the connections you make in that process as well. And you meet other like-minded people, and you pre progress. It's you know, it's it's really. I'm fortunate that I've been able to spend you know all my adult life in such an environment. It really is. And yeah, but you, if, if you don't like physics, you should go to it. <laughs> <It's too much. laughs> you won't like it. Well, you're probably saving a few people from, you know, the agony of, uh, what is it? Second year quantum mechanics, third year quantum mechanics. If you, if you don't like it, it's, it's tough, but it's, if you do like it, it's, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. That's right. Yeah. You're really dealing with reality. It's, it's very, very interesting. Anyways, thank you for taking your time today to uh, speak. I'm sure People have learned quite a bit about um, CERN and the Atlas Detector, and uh, hopefully a few are inspired to go into physics themselves as well.